The world is divided into four spheres, each sphere divided among continents and nations. Nations are divided by borders and interests. These interests divide the news. We examine the impact of these divisions on people and power. This is Imaginary Lines. Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Michael Fox. On May 23rd, El Salvador's Bishop of the Poor, the late Catholic priest Oscar Romero, will be beautified in San Salvador. Roughly a quarter of a million people are expected to attend the ceremony, which could open the door to Romero's potential sainthood. I'll speak with San Francisco State Professor Felix Curi about the life of Oscar Romero and the importance of his beautification. But first, a look at media in Latin America. The Washington-based NGO Freedom House has released its yearly evaluation of press freedoms throughout the world. However, the report uses a highly suspect method to conduct its evaluation before deeming a country either free, partly free, or not free. Interestingly, but perhaps not surprisingly, regions typically understood as advanced and capitalist, such as the United States, Western Europe, and Australia, are categorized as free. This determination is made despite the fact that there is a noticeable lack of diversity of media outlets in these countries, with ownership highly concentrated in the hands of the few. Moving on to the so-called not free category, Freedom House points out two notable examples from Latin America, Ecuador and Venezuela. In contrast to Western developed nations, both Ecuador and Venezuela display a high degree of media plurality, including a strong presence of community and alternative outlets. In the case of Ecuador, Freedom House takes issue with the country's communication law, which aims to democratize media outlets typically dominated by wealthy elites. The law obliges media outlets to uphold journalistic standards and prohibits the dissemination of manipulated information. In the case that violations occur, citizens now have a legal means to hold media outlets accountable. Venezuela's media laws work much the same way. The control that private business interests have held over the media in Latin America have given them a powerful tool in maintaining the status quo. We only need to look at the 2002 media coup in Venezuela for an example of how media can be used to derail democracy. If we were to accept Freedom House's categorizations, then we must accept the fact that media is free only when it is at the service of wealthy elites. This is now not the case in many countries in Latin America, and it's time for Freedom House and other NGOs to respect the will of the poor, working class, and indigenous majorities who were once systematically excluded from their nation's media landscape. On May 23rd, El Salvador's Bishop of the Poor, Monsignor Oscar Romero, will be beautified in San Salvador. Romero was a celebrated defender of social justice and the poor in the late 1970s while serving as Archbishop of San Salvador. He was a strong critic of the country's death squads at a time of intense government repression and was assassinated in March 1980 while delivering mass. Felix Curi is an ethnic studies professor at San Francisco State University. In the 1960s, while in his early teens, Curi worked with Romero as an altar boy in his hometown of San Miguel in eastern El Salvador. Felix Curi, welcome to Imaginary Lines. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. I appreciate this effort, to, this opportunity to talk about uh, uh, the life of Monsignor Romero. Felix, you knew Oscar Romero personally. What was it like working with him as an altar boy, and what kind of a man was he? He was a uh, uh, stoic, <laughs> serious. <laughs> Sometimes uh, we were afraid I would go to uh, confession <laughs> at times, and you know, I I was wondered why I had to pray as much for a few things that I did, and you know, so I I remember uh, how. Uh, we respected him, uh, and yeah, serious man, you know, war, uh, yes, and in those days he used to spend a lot of time with people who were wealthy, um, you know, that's, he was a conservative, but somebody who was, uh, was always talking about the gospel, you know, and talk to us about what is the the way and what we ought to do. Those were the things that I remember, and I never expected him to go through this a, a kind of conversion, and that's really like an important thing for me and my life and the people that I know. 
uh, because his conversion uh, was about dialogue, the, the possibility of human beings who have a particular view of the world could see the world from multiple points of view. And, and so that's uh, an amazing act of love to be open to others. Were there any indications before this transformation that Romero would become such an important voice for peace and justice? You know, over the years, I, I had read some of the things that I didn't pay that much attention then, but he was concerned back in my hometown about uh, how people uh, of faith behave and was critical of uh, the governor or the mayor of the town who kept uh, being re-elected, you know, from the same family. And so there were some signs that I couldn't see uh, because I didn't have the level of consciousness that I learned uh, later on in life, that we all have that awoken, awakening moment, right? And what was the mainstream media's portrayal of Oscar Romero in the last years of his life when he was most vocal in support of the poor? You know, I, the media in, in those days, um, La Prensa Gráfica, El Diario de Hoy, uh, were the most hateful of all, uh, inventing lies, rumors uh, that he was <laughs> uh, close to the guerrillas, uh, the guerrillas, and that he uh, was a communist, so he had uh, some sort of mental illness. It was really awful, and, and, and there were uh, articles and pay ads that appeared in all the newspapers blaming him of things that he had never done or supported, because he was also critical uh, of the left, but a lot more critical of the right so uh, the news media, even at these days, uh, when I read El Diario de Hoy, I, none of them, none of the major media at this point has ever said, we apologize for what we did, because there was a web of complicity between uh, the right wing, the, the, the elite, uh, the military, and, and the media. It was... Uh, uh, an attack every single day, you know. Um, they were responsible for instigating and planning his death. So what's the representation of Oscar Romero in the media today? And how's that changed from the demonization of the past? The, the representation of the, of the media these days is the representation uh, of a saint that belongs in the church, but is not the saint is not the representation of Jesus, the Jesus that came to El Salvador through him, who will go and be with the poor, you know. So now you have the hierarchy uh, of this big institution, and institutions sometimes, they have openings, right? And so, but it's being celebrated, uh, and I, I, I don't, I just hope that this becomes an opportunity for young people to learn about the courage that he had, the courage that even after his death, the courage to go on and struggle for social justice and peace. And, and so I think there are so many saints in the church, I just hope that he, his image and he, the history of, of Monsignor Romero is not sanitized. I think that it's being sanitized. That's my sense. So you believe that the image of Oscar Romero is being sanitized, as you say, or stripped of its political content. How so? Most definitely, most definitely. Uh, Monsignor Romero uh, will denounce uh, the structural sins, uh, the level of inequality, the disparities. And I think that in many ways, uh, that's what that elite that continues to be in power and hold the power. Because, you know, we got to the 1980s, uh, most of us didn't want to fight. Uh, and most of us wanted peace. And we had a long history of democratic participation, but there was never an opportunity to uh, do that. And he, he would walk among the people. He 
uh, would say that what happened in El Salvador was a form of Holocaust. And the U.S. Embassy knew absolutely everything that what happened in El Salvador. So it was really clear, and he would denounce the role of the United States as demand to stop sending weapons. And he would be doing the same uh, if he was in Venezuela these days, or if he was in Yemen uh, looking at, at the murderous uh, policies that are going on in front of us. And I think that uh, that's who he was. Thank you, Felix, for joining me on Imaginary Lines. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You have a good one. On Sunday, the world celebrated International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia, an effort to urge straight-identified people to support the struggle for LGBT rights and equality. The day gets a considerable amount of attention from both the media and the public. However, like many of these days aimed at increasing awareness, these efforts tend to provide only a superficial critique of the problems facing LGBT people. Many social realities that compound the oppression of LGBT folks are usually ignored. Can it be said that a poor gay person from a rural area living in a country where homosexuality is criminalized is facing the same oppression as a middle-class gay person living in an urban area in a country where gay marriage is legal? While these groups, of course, have a shared struggle, glossing over differences does a disservice to those seeking liberation. The trouble is that many campaigns cater only to the more privileged group. This, perhaps, is in order to ensure they don't jeopardize their funding sources. One example is the Human Rights Campaign, the group behind the viral Equal Sign campaign on Facebook a couple of years ago. The NGO has been the subject of criticism for its pandering to wealthy corporations and individuals at the expense of LGBT issues. This is particularly the case in its failure to take up the struggle of trans people. The fight for LGBT rights and equality requires allies, but these allies need to know who and what they're supporting. They also need to know that it's going to take more than a profile picture to achieve change. That's it for today's program. Thanks for watching the show. I'm your host, Michael Fox. Please join me next week.